Douglas. He has the toughest lesson of the day because it's after lunch. Not subject matter, but he's got to keep everybody awake. After everybody eats, they get settled in. But we keep keeping the building cool, so maybe that'll keep everybody going. But we are happy to have Brother Danny with us for our lectureship. We had a chance to visit with him during lunch and always enjoy being around him and his knowledge and the way he presents his material. I've heard several say they could listen to him for several hours, uh, but he does a, a wonderful job as well as all of our speakers. And I'm glad to have Brother Johnny also with us this weekend, but we're not introducing you. Just thought I'd say we're glad to have you here. We'll get to you later. We are uh, looking forward to another lesson from Brother Danny Douglas. His lesson this afternoon will be the church's concern for the lost. Come speak to us, Brother Danny. Thank you, Brother John. I'm glad now that I have permission to speak for several hours. <laughs> no, I, I won't do that at this time. But <laughs> I did just put a cough drop in my mouth. You know the significance of that? Wait a minute, where's that button on my... About the preacher one time that he always timed his sermons by a cough drop. He knew when he, his cough drop got down to the end, it was time to conclude. But one day... Instead of a cough drop, he put a button in his mouth. So uh, a little extra longevity there. But anyway, it is good to be here. I thank the Lord for this congregation. It's spring, and uh, we have something unusual here today. We have two faithful and sound elderships in this room. In the brotherhood today, it's hard to find even one. But I appreciate so much uh, Brother Brown, Brother Cone, Brother West, Brother Weldon, Brother Wayne, and Brother Bruce of, of the last three fish hatchery, which you know. And I'm so thankful for them and for the Lord's Church here and for the Lord's Church there. And appreciate these young brethren getting up here and leading singing and prayer and brother joshua and brother jonathan and thank you brother john for the kind words and uh, i appreciate the faithful members of this congregation so very much and uh, just so happens this morning i met a faithful sister in christ that came to the lord last year and I understand that she invites people all the time now to come visit the Lord's Church. I want to commend her for that. But I also want to commend the lady that just kept on asking her and asking her and asking her till finally she came to the services, finally obeyed the gospel. That's really involved in what we're talking about today. Because we are the church. The members make up the body of Christ, the church. And so we talk about the church's concern for the lost. Yes, that's the elders and the preachers for sure. But every member of the church, every member, we should be concerned for the lost. The foundation of our love and concern over the lost is the example of God. That's the foundation right there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3.16. Could there be a greater love than that and of the son? As Paul said, who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. Is that not the foundation for our concern and our example, for our love and concern for the lost soul? Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Galatians 1.4. 
Are we not to follow the example of God? Be ye therefore followers or imitators of God as dear children, Ephesians 5 and verse 1. Is this lesson needed? Just think about that question. Is it needed? I remember when I was just a young, well, I was younger. I'm still young, of course. Well, not really, but back when I was really a young preacher and uh, going to college, I started preaching for a congregation. For one year, I did. And that summer, they were having a gospel meeting. Because I was, well, I was about 20, 21 years old. I said, we, ought, we need to go out and knock on doors. And one of the older brethren had been there for years. So oh, I won't do any good. You might get one. Did he realize what he said? You might get one. That one soul is worth more than the whole world. But Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Of course, when it comes to this topic, friends, the first soul I need to be concerned about is mine. If I'm going to please God and go to heaven, I have to have a love not only for the brethren, those who are saved, but for the lost. Because if I don't, I'm not like the Lord. And if I'm not like the Lord, am I going to heaven? Are you? So we have to be concerned about our own soul. God is. The Father and the Son are. Are we concerned? Brethren are often more concerned about the condition of the church building. And I don't necessarily mean the congregations represented here. But I have seen some brethren get real concerned if something happened to the church building, the roof, the floor, or something. You know what I'm talking about. Have you ever been to business meetings? You know. They'd be more concerned about that than they will of the loss. Oh, well, yeah, well, let's, let's do something about that. Maybe this summer we can do it. But when it comes to fixing something to build, oh, we need to get to do that right now. You know, we need to take care of that. I know we need to keep our buildings in good order, but that's not the main purpose of our existence. Our purpose is to serve and obey God, to help one another get to heaven, and to reach the lost. The Lord came to seek and to save the lost, but we are to pick up and carry on His purpose and His work. Isn't that what Christians are? They're carrying on the Lord's work in His example. As Peter said, for even here until you call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. We should, we should follow His steps. You should follow His steps. First Peter 2.21 are we carrying on the Lord's example? Many times, uh, you know, we men, if we, if we dent up our car, uh, we get rather upset about that, don't we? And we get more urgent about that than we do spiritual things. Or maybe it's something wrong with the house. Our things often arrest our attention more quickly than spiritual matters heavenly things. Paul said, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11. 2 Corinthians 8, 8, Paul said, proved the sincerity of your love. The next verse, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he is rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye by his poverty might be made rich. And you know, Paul gives an inspired commentary on that in Philippians chapter 2 when he emptied himself, when he came to this earth, when he left the glories of heaven to come to this earth, sin-cursed earth, to live a life of suffering, shame, and we know that's what he did. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. i to read this correctly. Though the ye through his poverty might be rich. Now, oh, yeah, see, now I've got a reason to get rich now. That doesn't mean rich materially. Hearken, my beloved brethren, if not God not chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, 
James 2, 5. Christ didn't come to this earth to make us rich, friends. He came to this earth to make us rich spiritually with the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3, verse 8. But yet I have seen, and I'm sure you have too, people in the church, their main goal in life was the accumulation of money, assets, material things to be well off. I moved to a place one time to preach, and I went to a gospel meeting in another congregation in the area, and this brother there, he was an older brother, he said, you know, when you, get, when you go somewhere, you need to get, a, get on the good side of the money people. I thought, you know, what a worldly attitude that is. Be a respecter of persons, which God is not, Acts 10, 34 and 35, and we're not to be either, James 2, 1. We need to strive to be friends of God, like Abraham, James 2, 23. And Jesus tells us how to do that. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you, John 15, 14. And one of the things he commands us is to try to win the lost. He that win a souls is wise. Proverbs 11, verse 30. You know, if you look at that verse, I would have to say that there are a lot of brethren that aren't very wise. Because percentage-wise speaking, there are not a lot who are really working to win souls to Christ. You think about that. He that win a souls is wise. So I need to look at myself, and preachers do too, not just other members. Am I really working to win souls? Am I striving? Do I have concern for the lost soul? You and I need to self-examine ourselves. This time I'd like to come to Luke chapter 15. Here Jesus is trying to emphasize the importance of of a lost soul. Now we know that a multitude of souls are important. We understand that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But one soul is important. If you notice the two parables in Luke 15, of the lost sheep and the lost coin, there's only one lost sheep and only one lost coin. And then the story of the prodigal son that makes up the rest of the chapter it's only talking about one lost son. This ought to tell us something, my friends. For one thing, God puts a great value on every person. Every person. None of us should feel, well, I'm not important. You know, people can make you feel very unimportant sometimes, can't they? Maybe where you go to school, where you go to work, or the community, maybe even sometimes in your family. But if you feel unimportant, pick up your Bible. Don't keep your head in the world. Put your head in the Bible. Then you will know that you are important. First of all, for a few moments, I want to look at the lost sheep in uh, verses 3 to 6. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, Doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and goeth after that, go after that which is lost until he find it. Until he find it? He just kept searching until he find it. Are we determined? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. The sheep was lost, and he knew it, but didn't know how to come back home, didn't know the way back. So the one who found the sheep and brought it home. It wandered from the shepherd. You know, that's what we do in the church sometimes. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd that giveth his life for the sheep, John 10, verse 11. And those who are saved are those who have returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. 1 Peter 2, verse 25. That's talking about the saved. We know that uh, this is the duty of the Lord's church, to go find the lost sheep. 
Paul tells us that the house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, 15, what does the truth do? It saves. And you shall know the truth, and the truth, truth shall make you free. God would have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth, according to 1 Timothy 2, 4. So we cannot save anyone without the truth of God's Word. So I have to be close to God and to the truth and have it in my heart. The truth that dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever, 2 John verse 2. If you are an honest and sincere person and the tr truth dwelleth in you, then it is going to come out. It's going to come out. Like Jeremiah who said that the word of God was like a fire in his bones and he could not stay. He couldn't hold it in, Jeremiah 20 verse 9. Or like Peter and John, we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard there in Acts 4, 19 and 20. They had to tell it. You know, I uh, heard the story about, you probably heard this story, but an older preacher one time, he was training these students to preach. He said, boys, don't preach if you can help it. In other words, if you can hold it in and hold it back, you don't need to be a preacher. And that's true. People that just say, well, I, you know, I preach for a while, but, you know, I want to do something. You know, I'm not, his heart wasn't really in it. People like that are not meant to be preachers. But every Christian, whether we're a public preacher or not, among the men, we should all strive to be soul winners. I've known people in the church and ladies as well as men who were not public preachers on a regular basis that strove to win souls. That's a great thing. The child of God becomes lost and may be allured or distracted like a sheep or attacked. Of course, we are distracted and lured away if we become lost. That lost sheep following along with the shepherd and the other sheep Something caused him to go astray. Perhaps he, he took his eyes off of the shepherd, and no doubt that does happen spiritually and will happen, and will go astray. We're to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Or we allow something to sideline us and distract our attention and go off the cliff or down in the gutty or the valley or to a place of danger, or a wild animal. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Though the devil uses his children to lead God's children astray. We need to be aware of that. Could be a boy, a girl, man or woman, friend, fellow worker, schoolmate, uh, Somebody in our life or even in our family can lead us astray and away from God. We need to realize the devil is out there like a hungry, roaring lion roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. We recall Demas, Paul said, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. 2 Timothy 4.10 And if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. According to 1 John 2, verse 15. Many people get caught up in the love of the world. But sometimes people are, don't get necessarily involved in things that are intrinsically evil, that is sinful in and of themselves, but they just become distracted by earthly affairs too much. They get too much of their life. I've seen this in sports. Sports are not necessarily sinful, but I've seen some in the church that got so consumed with their sports that their time and attention and energy for the work of the Lord waxed weak. And you've probably seen that too. They even begin to miss services of the church because they're so involved in their sports. Again, we have to keep things in the right place. 
with Jesus and talking about the seed that fell among the thorns and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to, <clears throat> excuse me, to perfection. We may detect this in our own lives or perhaps a fellow Christian. Not that we're trying to pry into their business, but if we notice that their attendance begins to weaken and to wane. Or they or ourselves, we don't study the Bible like we used to. Or we don't pray like we used to. Or we're not as concerned about missing the services of the church as we once were. You know, a tender-hearted, young, sincere Christian, it really bothers them to miss any service of the church. But then as time goes on, sadly, they get like some of the other members. It doesn't bother them as much anymore. Well, I see Brother So-and-so over there. He doesn't come all the time. Or Sister So-and-so. And we know people do have reasons sometimes. They're sick or perhaps other reasons beyond their control. But we do know in the church we have people that have that problem. They're not as sincere and earnest about being in all the services of the church as they should be. If we realize that we are beginning to lack in spiritual things, think about what Paul said to Timothy. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, See, uh, I noticed this morning I was supposed to stop at a quarter till. It's all right. It's just now two o'clock. So, but we started at a different time, though. So I guess we got about thirty more minutes. You're in the same place. You need to keep going. <laughs> okay. Now let's look at the rejoicing here in Luke 15, verse five and six. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Jesus said in verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. This, my friend, shows how important it is to God for one soul to be saved. Now I'd like to look at the lost piece of silver, beginning at verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Although a coin is out of circulation, it still retains its value. The coin was lost, didn't know it, and didn't know the way back. We need to let people know, try to teach them that they are in a lost condition. And how do we do that? You take God's word and you teach them God's word, and they will see it. They will see it themselves. We cannot tiptoe around that truth. They need to know they're lost. Who did that on Pentecost Day as recorded in Acts 2? The Apostle Peter. and No doubt the other apostles too. When he said to them in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. We must let people know they're in a lost condition. And we also need to let people know that it's an urgent matter, that we can't just wait uh, a few days or a week or two. What about the Philippian jailer? He and his household were baptized in the wee hours of the morning. It was midnight in verse 25. In verse 31 to 34, they were taught the gospel and obeyed the gospel. The same hour of the night. 
And I'm sure there are other brethren here. I know I baptize people at 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we need to realize it's not something that we can wait. Uh, a young farmer one time was taught the truth, and he said he planned on obeying the truth one day. But then he had an accident on his farm. The ambulance came and got him. And on the way to the hospital, I mean, he was in a critical condition. He passed by the church building. He wanted to stop and to be baptized. But it didn't stop. He went to the hospital and he died. He waited too late. These things are reality. They happen. We notice that a lost soul is very valuable to God. One may attend the services of the Lord's church and be out of circulation and out of duty to God because their talents, their money, their wisdom, their time and usefulness are spent on earthly things rather than the kingdom of God, although they do come to the services. They're, they do not have themselves invested in the work of God. Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, verse 33. I wonder how many members of the church really do follow that. Seek first the kingdom of God. One may be lost in career, work, education, pleasure, courtship, and other activities, but too engrossed to be involved in the Lord's work. We need to put the Lord in His work first. Now the woman in the parable here lit a candle. She lit a candle. We have a light, don't we? It's the light of the gospel of Christ. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, David said. She swept the house and sought diligently for the lost piece of silver until she found it. We should be careful, diligent, and thorough, and persistent in matters of the soul, including our own. We need to give diligence to make our calling and election sure, 2 Peter 1 and verse 10. We should sweep the house, we should sweep the world and search for lost souls. Because God desires the salvation of every person. Christ came a long way to save souls. He came from heaven. How far are we going? Oh, you know, I just I can't go way out there and see those people. That's too much. What did God do? What did Christ do? Are we willing to sweep the world for a lost soul? The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Christ, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 and verse number 9. This includes evangelistic efforts to reach the lost. To go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way even to the end of the world. Matthew 28 verse 19 and 20. I had a good friend many years ago, Brother Grady Pitts. He's been dead now for, well, since uh, about 30 years, 29 or 30 years. He was a gospel preacher. Before he became a full-time preacher, though, he was, he was a faithful Christian. And uh, he would deliver dry cleaning to people's houses. You remember those days? They would deliver your dry cleaning and he would do that. And he would go into a house and talk to people. And he went into this one house and he talked to this family or this man about the Lord. Well, as time went on, Brother Pitts became a full-time preacher. And he went back to that area where he once worked and lived. And he was in a gospel meeting. A man came through the door. And Brother Pitts said... Uh, I know that. He was thinking, you know, how you see somebody, you start wondering, who is that? I know them. Or I remember them from somewhere. 
And after the service, that man introduced himself as the same person that Brother Pitts had delivered dry cleaning to many years before and talked to about the Lord. And he indicated that that talk had an influence on him obeying the gospel. Now, friends, it's, it's good to go out and do mission work and to support mission work. We need to do that, and I know that congregations here represented do that, and we do that where I preach. But there's some people that can't go out on a mission field like that. But us who do, and those also, we need to find people that we contact from day to day. After all, if, if we are the kind of Christian we should be, they will be impressed with our example and our words, our convictions, our purity, our kindness and love, and our godly example. They can tell that there's something different about that person. And we can have an influence on them. It could be someone that we go to school with, that we work with, someone in the community or the neighborhood, uh, the plumber, the mechanic, the grocer, our fellow workers. You know, friends, this is the way that many people are won to Christ. And preachers do this, but also mothers and girls, boys, and men that are not preachers or elders. This is something that you can do. And I've seen people in the church, and I know other brethren here will agree with me. They might not be able to or might not be apt to get up and make a public speech. But they're real good in talking to people, one-on-one. -on -one. They're really good at that. And if they love the Lord and they love souls, then certainly that is a great asset to the church. My friends, this opportunity that we're talking about is right here and right now. That's what it is. Right here and right now. Who taught that? The one who said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh ours. Behold, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to the harvest. John 4, 35. Jesus Christ said that. Our love for God will determine our love for the lost. If we really love God, and we really love Jesus Christ and what he has done, then we're going to love the lost, and we will turn that into action. In Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse number 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God has no pleasure in the soul who is lost and far off and away from God, and we shouldn't either. Before I close here in just a moment, I'd like to read from, go back to Luke 15. I'm not going to read the whole passage but about the prodigal son who came to himself, verse 17. You know, he had to hit rock bottom first, though, didn't he? He would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And he came to himself. And you know, friends, sadly, many people got to be on their back before they look up. They've got to hit rock bottom. But in Luke 15, we read of this young man as he came home. And he arose and came to his father... But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. His father saw him coming from afar. You know, there are many people who are far off from God, but they need to start heading back home again. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. There's humility. If a person doesn't have that attitude that I'm lost and I'm undone, I'm unworthy, then we're not going to be converted to Christ. We've got to be humble and realize our need for God. 
But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kid it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. That tells us what being lost means. It means a dead person. Like the woman that liveth in pleasure in 1 Timothy 5. She's dead while she liveth. She's a walking dead person. And we've got a lot of people on this earth that are walking dead people because they are dead in sin without Jesus Christ. Well, this here represents God's love and concern for the lost soul. That's what the father represents. And the prodigal son who comes home, that represents the sinner who comes to God. My friends, thank you for your attention. Good to be with you.